person you have called is speaking to someone else. You can wait or call again later. आपने जिस व्यक्ति को कॉल किया है वो अन्य कॉल पर Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jane Stevens. I'm the training manager here at Zolo. We're talking about leases today. I'm going to give it a few minutes just to allow a few more people to join us before we get started. Uh, so let's start in three minutes. Thanks. I'll be back, guys. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think I was just talking to myself there. I had my uh, microphone off, so please let me know that you can hear me. I'm just admitting some people to the meeting here. Again, just let me know that you can hear me and we'll get started. All right, so today we are talking about leases. My name is Jane Stevens. I am the training manager here at Zolo. Awesome, glad that you guys can hear me. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna be talking about leases. So if you guys are brand new to Zolo, brand new to real estate, then you know that you are required to do five leases before we turn on your buyer leads. So those leads do come in fast and furious. You will get a lot of lease leads in your CRM. So it's really important to have a system in place and really important to know what questions to ask them during that initial phone call so that you are pre-qualifying them. You are spending time with people who do stand a chance at getting an accepted offer. So we're definitely going to talk about that today. And this is a training session. So we are also going to be talking about how to actually prepare that offer in web forms and what you need to do to get it accepted. Some tips that have worked in the past that I've shared with others. I've gotten good feedback on. So um, yeah, hopefully these will work for you as well. So I'm going to turn off my camera so that you guys can just focus on the slides and let me know if you have any questions. I'll turn my camera on again at the end. All right, let's get started. All right. 
So why do leases? As I said, of course, here at Zolo, you are required to do five leases if you're brand new to real estate, but there are seasoned realtors who still keep their lease leads on. There are so many reasons why. <laughs> One of them is cash flow. Lease deals are oftentimes uh, a shorter close, so you can get them done quickly, as opposed to you know buyers who may take a little bit more time. So um, let me just mute everybody here. If you do have questions, just feel free to um, you know, raise your hand, I'll turn on your mic, that sort of thing, uh, or you can chat with me as well. Um, all right, so other activities as to why to do leases, it does, or other reasons why to do leases, is it does keep your CRM active. So you want to be telling the Zolobot that you're an active agent. So if you don't have any buyer leads at the moment, turn on your lease leads, go out, do some showings, enter in all that activity in the CRM. Active agents are rewarded with leads. So, you know, definitely having those lease leads updating your activity will reward you with even more leads. So uh, it definitely increases your CRM activity. Um, and then also it does grow your network of potential buyers. I think this is probably one of the most uh, important reasons that uh, seasoned agents will still do leases because it does grow your network. And people who are leasing now may have the goal, often have the goal of buying later on. So, you know, put them into a one-year lease, follow up with them and see if they're ready to buy in a year, maybe longer, maybe less. So I think uh, for, for those of us who have done leases for a long time, uh, can attest that many lease leads do turn into buyer leads. So, um, you know, it is definitely worth your time. And of course, the reason why we require that you do five leases here at Zolo before you get those buyer leads is because you really will become familiar with the real estate paperwork. In fact, once you get to buyers, if you've done a number of leases, uh, a buyer transaction will feel like a walk in the park in terms of paperwork, just because there are so many um, additional requirements or, or additional things that you're doing uh, when you're working on leases. So what I mean by that is you're sort of wearing all of the hats. So when you're working with a lease lead, you're kind of also doing the job of mortgage agent because you're pre-qualifying. You, you want to know what their income is. You want to know what their credit score is. Uh, of course, you're still wearing the hat of a realtor. You're taking them out on showings. Hopefully they like something that you show them. And then at the end, you know, not only are you doing the paperwork, uh, but you'll also take over that role of, you know, lawyer, right? When the deal closes, you're going to be the one making sure that they get their keys and that everything is finalized properly. So definitely it gives you really good exposure to uh, real estate and the paperwork. So Let's jump in. People are still um, joining us. So I'm just admitting everybody here. Um, let's talk about leases. So we're going to start off by talking about contacting the lead and pre-qualifying them. As I said, this is a really important component because you will get a lot of lease leads in your CRM and you want to make sure that you're pre-qualifying them so that you know that you're working with somebody who uh, it does have a good chance of getting an offer accepted. If you're asking those questions on the phone and it turns out they have a really low credit score, maybe their employment has been interrupted because of COVID and they've been on CERB for several months, then, you know, in that case, still provide them with good customer service, point them in the direction of maybe the listing agent, maybe point them in the direction of Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace, where landlords are posting their properties directly and they'll have less requirements than if they involve a realtor. So just letting them know that, uh, you know, those other <laughs> options exist for them so that they still walk away with information, even though you're not able to help them. Uh, so really important to pre-qualify them so that you are spending time with people who actually, uh, you know, stand a chance at getting a property. We'll talk about the rental application. We'll talk about showing properties. We're definitely going to talk about how to prepare an offer. And then, as I said, at the end, we'll talk about closing that transaction. So let's talk about contacting the lead. So of course, if you get uh, a call come in and you don't recognize the phone number, assume it's a Zolo lead, answer your phone professionally, and you wanna start off the conversation with how can I help you? Oftentimes, if you are picking up an inbound call though, I find that people uh, assume that you're the listing agent, right away start asking you about the property. They may have questions about several different properties, um, in which case, you know, just let them know, you know, you're going to pull up the information on the MLS system and you'll be able to answer all of their questions uh, that way, because oftentimes you're going to be asking for, you know, when is this one available for? And that's something that's hidden on the Zolo site. So you definitely want to be in front of your computer, ideally, so that you can look up the information that's available on TREB that's not visible on Zolo. So um, it definitely responding to their questions, having a conversation with them, 
finding out what it is that they're looking for and why. And at some point during that conversation, you're going to want to turn the table so that you can explain the process to them. So just ask them, you know, once they've disclosed everything that they're looking for and why, you might want to reiterate that, right? Like, okay, I understand you're looking for, you know, a condo in Toronto, one bedroom, ideally with a den because you're working from home, whatever it is, just reiterate the search criteria that they've shared with you and then ask them if they're familiar with the process. And really it doesn't matter if they say yes or no, explain the process anyway, because this is your opportunity to insert those pre-qualifying questions. So explain the process, ask them if they're familiar with the, um, the lease market, let them know it's really competitive. So if their budget is, let's say 2,500, they shouldn't be looking at properties that are 26, 27, 2,800, because oftentimes we see that properties are going for full price maybe even a little bit more, maybe $50 more a month, $100 more a month. So already you're kind of explaining that process and setting that expectation. And they're not going to really be able to negotiate a lot, uh, especially if there are other offers on the property. You know, sometimes people are offering more of a deposit. Uh, so definitely just letting them know that it is really competitive. And then also explaining that the landlords are going to want to see their credit score and they're going to want to know their income. And this is your opportunity to ask them those questions. And again, make the landlord the bad guy. It's not you who's you know, setting this, this criteria. It's the landlord who wants to see a credit score of at least 650. Um, I've seen actually in brokerage remarks now that listing agents ask for a credit score of 700. Uh, so if that's the case, let them know uh, what the credit score should be and ask them what their credit score is. Ask them if they know what it is. Ask them if they already have their Equifax credit report printed or downloaded. Uh, so you have an understanding as to not only what their credit score is, but are their documents ready? And then also ask them what their income is. And just again, let them know that the landlords typically want to see that the rent isn't going to be more than 30% of their income. So sometimes lease leads will tell you, yeah, no problem. I can definitely afford 2,500. My income is 5,000. That's half of their income. So get a little bit creative, do some digging, ask, you know, a lead that discloses that. Maybe if they have other additional sources of income uh, that they're not disclosing, maybe that's what they make from, you know, their job, that's their employment income, but maybe they have another source. Maybe they're receiving child tax benefit, um, you know, child support, whatever the case is, and then that adds to their income. So asking them those questions. And then once you've determined that they are in fact qualified, then ask them the last question, when would you like to see some property? So you're converting that call to a showing. So really, really important here. Uh, you wanna provide the information. And once you've determined that yes, you can in fact help them, they have a good credit score, they have good income, then when would you like to see some properties? As I already mentioned, if they don't have a great credit score, then just still provide them with good customer service and point them in the right direction. The GG, Facebook Marketplace, uh, whatever, whatever it is. So that's the inbound call. Very similar to that, we have the outbound call. So, you know, we don't, we're not always able to answer our phones. We try as best we can, but uh, if you miss a call for whatever reason, hopefully you're calling them back within five minutes, even if it's just to let them know, you know what, I'm in showings right now, but I can give you a call back in an hour. Does that work for you? Hopefully you can set that up and call them back in an hour. So really, really important to get back to them right away. Even if you can't really engage in a conversation with them, call them back to schedule a time where you can have that conversation with them. So calling them back, introducing yourself as an agent from Zolo.ca. I find that if you say Zolo Realty, they don't, uh, they don't know that as well as they know Zolo.ca. Um, and then just remind them, I see that you inquired about 123 Main Street, how can I help you? So again, have that conversation, find out what it is that they're looking for, ask them those pre-qualifying questions. If you determine that yes, in fact, they are qualified, when would you like to see the property? So you're converting that call to a showing. So let's talk about these pre-qualifying questions. This is really an overview of the system that you should have in place. Uh, so first of all, you wanna be having that conversation. So you wanna be engaging with the client. How can I help you? When are you available to view the property? Keep those two questions in mind and in between those two questions, have that conversation and include these pre-qualifying questions. Again, the landlord, make the landlord the bad guy. It's not you who's requiring a credit score of, you know, 650, 680, 700. It's the landlords that want to see that. And also make it about the landlord needing to see that their rent isn't more than 30% of their income. So again, really explaining that to them and finding out what their credit score is and what their income is. 
Now, I find that if people are defensive, they don't want to share that with you, chances are they're probably not qualified. People who are qualified will tell you, yeah, no problem, my credit score is in the 700s, and yes, you know, my partner and I make X amount of money each year, so that uh, is no problem in terms of affordability. So, you know, people who are qualified will share that with you. Send them an email after you've had this conversation and you want to send them the rental application. So there's a couple of reasons why you want to send an email. Not everybody is going to put you into their phone as, you know, my preferred realtor after just one phone call with you. Um, so send them a rental application. That way they have your email address and hopefully you have an email signature that does have your contact information. You can also reiterate in the email what their search criteria is and what documents they need to compile. In addition to the email, I would also recommend setting them up on a trip search. So now they're going to be getting properties that actually match their search criteria every day directly from you. So send the email with the rental application and set them up in Treb. And then of course, from there, hopefully they like something that you've sent them. You can go out and show them some properties. Hopefully you're showing more than one because again, you want to do these deals pretty quickly. So you don't want to be showing them one property on Tuesday, another property on Thursday, and then another property on Saturday. That's a lot of time. So hopefully you can get them to choose their top three. You show them on Saturday at one o'clock and hopefully from there they like property number one and you can go ahead and write the offer. So really having a system in place where you're not spending hours and hours and hours with a lease lead, um, you're sort of condensing it all into one one sort of showing. So two, three to four properties over one day, um, maybe two if you need to go out an additional day if they really didn't like anything from day one. Um, and then asking for the business, making sure that uh, you know you ask them at the end of each property, what did you think of this property compared to the last one? Which one do you prefer? And then hopefully from there, you'll know by the end of doing a few showings, which one they like and which one they wanna put an offer in on. So at that point you would receive the paperwork and of course prepare the offer. So we'll talk about that separately, but I think I have a question coming in. So let me just see uh, for someone who isn't qualified. How would you action that lead in the CRM? There is no not qualified option on the CRM. Yeah, great question. So um, the way I would do it is I would say call. Yes, I would put in the notes there that um, you know, we had a conversation, their credit score was low, you know, not qualified, uh, pointed them in the right direction. And then the next screen comes up and it asks you um, you know, if they're, if they are a realtor, if they're working with a realtor and one of them says not interested, that's usually the button I press if they're not qualified. So I know you're right. It doesn't, it's not a not qualified option, but just go ahead and click on not interested. So, um, that way it does, uh, count towards your calls, right? Cause you're entering it as a call. Yes. Awesome. All right. So here's just a few more pre-qualifying questions. Basically the same questions I just shared with you, just different ways of asking it. So again, I mentioned asking them if they're familiar with the process. You may also want to ask them, have you recently rented a property? Again, it doesn't matter the answer to this question. This is your segue into asking them those pre-qualifying questions. So again, landlords want to see your credit score and employment letter. Do you have your credit report? Do you know your credit score? Do you have a letter of employment? Do you have an employment contract? Do you have your recent pay stubs? So these are all ways that you can find out uh, what their income is. And then you can ask them, of course, if the rent is less than 30% of their income. Again, that's going to be another criteria that the landlord is uh, looking for. And then in addition to that, definitely ask them questions about their situation. So where are they living now? When is their lease up? Have they given notice? When are they looking to move? Uh, and a good question to ask also about their situation is who will be living with you. So um, it's important to ask them where they're living now, when their lease is up. Those kinds of questions will disclose their timeline. So maybe they're in a situation and you know, ideally this is a situation that they're in where maybe the landlord is thinking about selling the property that they're currently leasing. leasing. Um, so they're flexible, they can, you know, as soon as they find something that they like, they can move quickly. If you're working with somebody who says to you they haven't given their notice yet, then you know that the properties that are on the market right now are probably available within the next 30 days. Uh, you know, not too many are available for 60 days out and uh, they haven't provided their notice yet, which, and they're required to give 60 days. So it's important that they are ready and that they're ready within sort of 30, 30 days, ideally, so that again, you can do these transactions quickly. By asking who will be living with you, that's again, just gonna, um, help you determine um, what their situation is. And there are some situations that are gonna be easier than others. So if you have, 
you know, a professional couple or if you have a family, uh, those situations are easier than, for example, the roommate situation. So if you're talking to them and they're looking for a two bedroom, but there's going to be five adults sharing the rent, that's going to be really difficult for you to get accepted. So again, just another question to ask so that you can determine whether or not you're going to work with them. And if not, if you decide that you can't, again, just pointing them in the right direction so they still walk away, um, you know, with knowledge. How do you deal with self-employed people? Yeah, so self-employed people um, are gonna be a little bit different, you're right, so you wouldn't have an employment contract, you wouldn't have pay stubs necessarily, but hopefully they do have their notice of assessment from the previous year. Uh, hopefully they have bank statements. You have to get a little bit creative when you're working with people who are self-employed. Um, so asking them for a uh, bank statement, asking them for a notice of assessment from the previous year, uh, anything else that they have to support their income, um, you know, will need to be shared with you. So definitely talk to them about that. All right. So yeah, just asking for different paperwork in that, in that case. All right. So don't forget, of course, after having that initial call with anybody <laughs> with a lease leader, otherwise, you want to make sure that you're entering your activity in the CRM. Again, the Zolobot is going to reward active agents. So make sure that you are one of them. <laughs> Enter in your activities, call yes, that will move them into the engage folder, but don't forget about them. Make sure that you are adding a note. So if you did talk to them about their search criteria, put that in there. And if they are thinking about looking at properties over the weekend, schedule a follow-up for Friday. So you can just confirm that yes, in fact, they're available and you can take them out on showing. So you don't want anybody to fall through the cracks, use your CRM. Um, and also I, I recommended this before, usually I talk about this in the new agent orientations, but have an Excel spreadsheet that you can kind of keep track of as well in terms of who you've spoken to, um, you know, what their search criteria is, what their client URL is. So uh, the client profiles, in the Zolo CRM, they all have unique URLs when you click on their, on their name. So just keeping track of that as well so that you can easily find them when you have spoken to them and you can update activities. So really important to update activities always. All right, all right, let's uh, move on to that email that I was talking about. Um, should we send a blank rental application at the beginning? Yes, great question and super timely. So <laughs> that's what I'm talking about here. So you definitely wanna have that conversation with that lease lead. If you've determined again, as I said, that they are going to be qualified, you stand a good chance of getting them an accepted offer, then yes, follow up with an email and attach the rental application. And this is just a sample that I use. Feel free to, to take what you like from it. Um, but basically just send them an email thanking them for their interest. Let them know the properties that they inquired about are available. Or maybe you say, I'm going to show you these properties on Saturday at one. I'll follow up with an itinerary. Uh, but in the meantime, so the second paragraph, I'm attaching a rental application for you to review. And then you can say here for you to um, complete before viewing properties. But typically, you know, I'm going to rely, I do rely on the conversation that we've had. I don't ask them to send me anything back uh, because again, you know, you're asking for personal information here. So you can understand why maybe a tenant wouldn't want to share that initially, um, you know, with somebody who they've never met and before they've even found a property. So as long as you feel that they have answered, honestly, they weren't defensive, they disclosed their credit score, they've told you that they have, you know, good income coming in, then, you know, base it on that and go to the in-person showing. But here you can reiterate what documents they need. So if they find a property that they like, that you can assist them with an offer to lease. And at that time, landlords will request the following documents. So this is again, just reiterating the conversation you already had over the phone. So credit report, proof of income, and then I usually put in brackets, letter of employment and pay stubs, and then photo ID. The photo ID is for you, of course, to verify that you are uh, working with who they say they are. And then as soon as the offer is accepted, you'll also need your deposit ready, which is typically the first and last month's rent. So nice to give them a heads up about that so that they're not, um, you know, surprised that, you know, they have a, a $2,500 lease and they need to come up with a $5,000 deposit. Give them a heads up so they know that. And then please let me know if you have any questions. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you with your home search. So just having some sort of follow-up email that you can send them after you've had that initial conversation with them. All right. Sorry, I just yeah. About the rental application. So um, would we get them to fill it out beforehand or? So I don't usually, I usually rely on the questions that I've asked them over the phone. Um, sometimes people will send you back their rental application completed before showings, but I find that that's rare. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, usually they're ready to fill in the rental application and actually send you all their paperwork once they've met with you and once they found a property that they like. 
And I think that's fair. As long as you know the information beforehand, then yeah. ask them to fill in the rental application once they've found something. Yeah, and it's okay to still attach a blank copy of it or sh we can just modify this email. Yeah, absolutely. So I attach a, a blank rental application and take from this email whatever you like. I know some agents have you know, added more details. So for example, the landlord's gonna wanna see a credit report. You might wanna put in links where they can go to download their credit report. So you can add things like that. Yeah, sorry, just in the email it says, in the meantime, I'm attaching a rental application for you to review and complete before viewing properties. So that's not necessary. Like we do not have to do that. No, and in fact, I usually take it out, but- Yeah, uh, it might scare the- Yeah, I agree. So um, I should probably attach an updated <laughs> screenshot of the email that I send, but, uh, but yeah, so you can put that, some people like putting that in, but I would recommend not, not putting it in. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so should we try to refer to other agents in workplace in case an agent likes to work for a less qualified lead? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely you can put it in there. So um, yeah, if you have a lease lead who may be a little bit uh, difficult to get, a, to get an offer accepted for, then yeah, you might want to put it on the workplace group under referrals and just disclose, you know, credit score is low or roommate situation, see if anybody picks it up. But if not, I would definitely just point them in the direction of maybe even the listing agent, but definitely Kijiji and uh, Facebook Marketplace. So yeah, there you go. All right, so let's talk about this rental application. Just briefly, obviously this is coming from your client, so the tenants are gonna fill it in with all of their personal information, um, but just make sure that they're representing themselves well. Our job is to make our clients look really great on paper. <laughs> so maybe they've disclosed their net income instead of their gross income. Maybe they didn't mention anything about you know, their side hustle that you know, brings them in $1,000 extra a month, or like I said before, their child tax benefit or child support. So really ask them questions. Uh, and you'll see that also when they submit their uh, supporting documents if they've disclosed their gross income or net. So you may want to receive the rental application from them, but still copy type it in web forms. You know, again, just kind of making them look better on paper than they may have, you know, initially disclosed. And then just sending it to them with the offer package for them to sign and authentic to sign. All right. I'm getting a question here. Awesome. I have a template my GM created and it has links and rental applications where clients can pull out their credit report credit report and fill out rental applications. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, email that I shared with you is very simple, uh, but you can definitely add to it. You can have links where they can go and download the credit report. If you have a fillable rental application, you may even send that to your client. So yeah, definitely you can get fancy with it. <laughs> I just have a really simple one that I've shared with you guys, but definitely take what you want from it and definitely add what you'd like to it as well. All right, so let's talk about showing properties. Hopefully you do set them up on prospect search. So again, if you guys are new to real estate, I know you guys have taken your TREB orientation. There's a lot of information in that orientation. So I like to just point out what you need to know <laughs> uh, when you've had that conversation with a lease lead. So you want to be sending them properties directly from TREB. So whatever MLS system you're using, you wanna set up either a prospect search or collab. Prospect search is really easy. It's very simple. You simply click on search on the sidebar in Treb, and then you can select prospect searches. You can set them up with their name, their search criteria, and automatically every morning, they're gonna get an email with properties that match their search criteria. If you set them up on, coll on Collab, I won't talk about that here. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more advanced and I believe it requires a password that they, so they kind of need to sign up. So it might be, you know, some people might not take the two minutes that it requires to set up. So prospect search is really simple. At least you know they're gonna get it in their inbox every morning with new properties that match their search criteria. And hopefully they're simply replying to that email saying, you know what, we wanna see properties one, two, and three. Um, and you can go ahead and schedule those. If they get back to you saying they wanna see every single property, all 10 properties, uh, push back a little bit, just let them know, you know, once you see more than three or four, you're not gonna know which kitchen goes with which backyard. <laughs> so just let them know they all start to look the same uh, so that you can really narrow it down, ask them to pick their top three or four, because again, that's going to, um, you know, involve less time on your end and hopefully get them really to pick their top three or four. 10 is too many to look at in a day. And hopefully from there, they're, they're choosing one to apply to. All right. So prospect search, set them up and then take them out on showing. So 
As you know, you're scheduling your showings either online or you're calling the listing brokerage. And what you're gonna probably receive is a confirmation email if it does get confirmed, and that's where you will have the lockbox code. So just make sure that you're recording that uh, somewhere in your calendar. I like to recommend that you have you know, all of these showing scheduled as separate appointments in your calendar, I like to kind of keep a status as to, you know, where I'm at. So if they've requested a showing, but I haven't booked it yet, um, I might put in brackets, you know, showing with so and so and then I'll put in brackets book. So that's a reminder that I still need to book it. But if I've gone ahead and booked it and I'm waiting for confirmation, you might want to change that to to be confirmed. And then once you do receive the lockbox, you change that to the lockbox code. So it just kind of keeps you on top of what you're still waiting for, what you've requested, what you haven't. Um, and then once you do have the lockbox codes, of course, you wanna make sure that you are not sharing that with your clients. And of course you wanna attend all of your showings and if you must cancel, cancel. Um, we've had situations where you know clients have pulled up, they don't like it from the outside, they decide not to go in, that would still require a cancellation. So just going back to your emails, make sure that you keep all of those confirmations because oftentimes, depending on the software that the listing brokerage is using, you can go into that email, manage your appointment and cancel it online. So you don't even need to call the listing brokerage, but really important to cancel if you're not able to make it because if you don't, it could result in a fine. And I believe they're around $500. So just avoid that by canceling if you need to. Even if you showed up and you didn't walk into the property, again, that would require a cancellation. All right. Okay, so once you've taken them out on a showing, this isn't a CRM training, but just a reminder to go into your CRM after you've gone on the showing to update that activity. As soon as you do that, they're going to receive a text message saying, how do you rate your Zolo agent? So make sure that you're entering that showing after you've taken them out on showings so they're not receiving that text message prematurely. So just a reminder to go into your CRM um, and adding that activity. All right, so once you have shown them a property, hopefully, as I said, they like something that you showed them and they do want to go ahead and prepare an offer to lease. So let's talk about that and let's talk about the documents that are requ required. So of course, at this point, you're gonna need the rental application from your client. So the tenant will fill out the rental application and send it to you along with the required documents that you already talked to them about. So their credit report, their employment letter, pay stubs, however it is that they're proving income. Yes, if they're self-employed, this will be different. Uh, their photo ID, give them a heads up about the deposit check. They don't need to provide one at this point, uh, but just letting them know that if they are interested, they need to submit all these documents and really making sure that even though you haven't received these documents before taking them out on a showing, just make sure that they do have these documents readily available. So, you know, if it's going to take them two days to get an employment letter, um, then the property is leased at that point, right? And then you have to start the process all over again. So really make sure they have this ready. So if they don't have an employment letter, uh, you know, available, then, you know, pay stubs will work. So really making sure that they can submit your, their documents to you as quickly as possible so that you can go ahead and prepare the agreement to lease with the attached schedules. So just know that in web forms, schedule A will already be auto populated for you, but we're going to talk about that. Really make sure that the clauses that are in there um, are what you need for this particular property and that you're adding anything else that you may need for that property. The example I always use is a property with a pool. So the standard schedule A that we auto populate for you in web forms doesn't talk about a pool because most properties don't have one. But if you are leasing a property that has a pool, make sure that you're putting a clause in there about who's going to open the pool, who's going to maintain it. So in other words, just pay attention to the agreement to lease and look at the Schedule A and really think about that property that you're leasing. The Schedule B is provided by the listing agent or the listing brokerage and is often an attachment to the MLS listing. But just keep in mind the Schedule B talks about the deposit, right? Because the deposit is going to be delivered to the listing brokerage and it talks about what's going to happen to that deposit. So a lot of listing brokerages uh, or a lot of brokerages, I should say, um, don't have a Schedule B for leases because the deposit is usually smaller. So if it's not there, it may not be required. You can reach out to the listing agent and ask if they require a Schedule B, but if it's not attached to the MLS listing, it's probably not required and just go ahead with your Schedule A. All right, the confirmation of co-op is also something you're going to want to prepare. 
Um, and so that's really going to form your lease, right? So the agreement to lease and confirmation of co-op is going to form your offer to lease. But in addition to that, you're also going to have a tenant representation agreement and working with a realtor that needs to be signed. This is between you and your client. This authorizes you to prepare this lease. So if you haven't already prepared uh, or have had this signed, then you definitely want to make sure that you're getting this signed at the same time as preparing the agreement to lease and the confirmation of co-op. Last but not least, a FinTrack is only required for leases if they're providing a deposit of more than $10,000. So it's typically not required, but you know, if you're leasing a really fancy property and uh, you know, it's $6,000 a month, obviously your deposit is going to be more than $10,000. But typically what happens is you, know, you may be offering an increased deposit. So it may be the first and last five months, so you're offering a six month deposit, then that would likely be more than $10,000. So if that's the case, you do need to complete a FinTrack. But if it's less, don't worry about it, that's not required. Last but not least, you'll need the residential tenancy agreement. So technically speaking, this should be prepared by the listing agent because it's between the landlord and the tenant. It's done after everything has been accepted because it reiterates the accepted terms in the agreement to lease. So just know that oftentimes I recommend that uh, if you are representing the tenant that maybe you offered to do this uh, because then you know it's gonna get done and it is required. So residential tenancy agreement is something that you prepare after everything has been accepted. So the good thing about all of this is you don't need to remember all of the forms that are required because they are in web forms. All you will need to do is select the appropriate template and all of these forms will be auto-populated for you to complete. All right, uh, yeah, if you want a screenshot of this, absolutely, you can take a screenshot or uh, yeah, just email me and I can send it to you as well. Absolutely, all right, so. Uh, web forms. So let's talk about that. So if you are preparing an offer to lease, you can go to web forms from Treb's homepage, but I'm actually going to recommend that you pull up the property that you're going to write an offer on. I'm going to ignore this slide. So pull up um, the property that you're going to write an offer on. So let's just say, you know, it's a property in Oakville. It's for rent and it's available for $4,200. You'll see up at the top here, web forms authenticine. So if you click on web forms from the MLS listing, that's going to take you to web forms and it's going to auto populate some of this information, such as the address, such as, such as the seller's name. Uh, so it'll do a little bit of the work for you so you won't have to um, copy type this information. So click on web forms from the MLS listing that takes you directly to MLS and right away you'll see you won't have to create a transaction because you're coming from the MLS listing. So this will come up. The address will be already typed in here for you. So the deals department does want you to name all of your transaction kits with the address of the property. So give the deals department what they want, uh, but just for your own tracking purposes, put your client's name in brackets so you'll remember who this lease transaction is for. <laughs> Selecting from the templates, there's three different Zolo residential template kits. So one of them is offer to lease, which of course, if you're preparing an offer to lease, which is what we're talking about, that's what you would select. Uh, the other two are for purchases. So if you're submitting an offer on a condo or submitting an offer on a freehold property, those are also available, but because you're doing a lease, this is the template that you would select. Um, you are going to import data from that MLS listing that you're coming from. And again, if you had come from that MLS listing, that MLS number would be auto populated for you. And it's going to add you automatically as the cooperating salesperson. So you can go ahead and create that transaction kit. And that is going to auto populate all of those forms that I just talked about. Uh, so again, you don't need to remember those. It will be here uh, as part of your template kit. So uh, the rental application you'll see is available here. So again, if you need to copy type that rental application, if your tenants provided it to you, but they didn't disclose their gross instead of their net income, again, you can go ahead and copy type the information uh, you know, cleanly in a new rental application. The offer summary document is actually not required for leases, but oftentimes listing agents will ask for it. So that's why we have it included in this template kit. If they ask for it, send it to them. If not, again, it's not necessary. The agreement to lease and the confirmation of co-op, that's going to be your offer to lease. And then, as I mentioned before, your tenant representation agreement and working with a realtor, those are also required. And that's just something you're going to save uh, because it's between you and your client. And it is something you are going to need to upload to your checklist later on when you have an accepted offer. So there you go. Those are your forms. All you need to do in web forms is click on each of these forms to fill in the blanks. So uh, as you can see here, I've clicked on the agreement to lease and your agreement to lease 
would appear on the screen and you'd be able to go ahead and enter in any of the blanks. Again, if you have come from the MLS listing, there will be some information that's already auto-populated for you. Um, and then you just go ahead and click on the term of the lease, what the rental rate is gonna be. So I have a bit of a cheat sheet here that I'm going to share with you because there are 10 paragraphs that you need to complete in the agreement to lease. So let me just share that with you. So again, the agreement dated today's date, you're gonna have the tenant's name, the landlord's name, and the landlord's address we just leave blank because we don't have that. And then the 10 paragraphs, so this is what they're called. So paragraph one is called premises. That's where you put in the property address. Paragraph number two is the term of the lease. So here's where you can put in one year or two years. Paragraph three is asking for the rent. So again, if it's available, we're just doing easy math here. Um, if it's available for $2,000, hopefully you're offering $2,000 or maybe a little bit more. The deposit and the, and the prepaid rent, this is probably the paragraph that, uh, you know, when you're preparing your very first offer to lease, this is probably where you're going to have questions. <laughs> so the tenant delivers, and then you have three options as to how the tenant is going to deliver their deposit. It can either be done upon acceptance, which means, you know, within 24 hours of the offer being accepted, they need to deliver their deposit to the listing brokerage or they can deliver it here with. In other words, you've asked your tenant to go to the bank, send you a picture of the bank draft, and then you can attach it to the offer, or you can select as otherwise described in this agreement. So that may be because they're going to wire transfer the deposit, uh, maybe they're gonna structure the deposit in two payments, whatever it is, you would be selecting as otherwise described in this agreement. So that needs to be payable to the listing brokerage. So here you wouldn't actually say listing brokerage, you would say Remax, Sutton, Royal LePage, Zolo, who, whatever, whoever the listing brokerage is, you're gonna put in who they need to make that bank draft payable to. And then you need to disclose, of course, what the amount is. So again, using easy math, if it's a $2,000 lease, then it's a $4,000 deposit. And that's gonna be applied against first and last month's rent. So that's how you fill in the blanks. Now, it's not always that easy. Sometimes you will have tenants who, you know, may offer to take possession a little bit earlier, and that may be something you suggest in order to get their offer accepted. So let's say they want to take possession seven days before the end of the month, you're going to have to calculate the daily rate. So just a quick note about how to prorate rent. Again, using this really simple math, $2,000, uh, you don't just divide that by 30. That's not going to give you an accurate daily rate. So you want to make sure that you're multiplying that by 12 months and then dividing that by 365 days. That's going to give you your accurate daily rate. You're going to multiply that by seven days if that's, you know, how early they're going to be taking possession. And then just add that to paragraph four. So in this case, you would say now the tenant is going to deliver $4,460.25 against seven days plus first and then last month's rent. So there is enough room for you to put that in there in the form. So just explain what it is that they're providing and why. Uh, the rest of the paragraphs are a little bit more self-explanatory. Uh, paragraph five, what's the use of the property? It's gonna be residential for the most part. Um, unless it's a commercial property, you'd be using a different form. So just say residential or single family use. Services and costs, just go back to the MLS listing, take a look at what's included, what's not included, and you simply check off what is or isn't the tenant's responsibility. Parking, if you had a condo, you would probably put in the stall number here, but if it's a detached home, just make sure that uh, you're stating two car garage, two private driveway. Um, you're kind of trying to anticipate any conflict and hopefully trying to avoid it, right? So you don't want the landlord taking up half of the garage. <laughs> if it's in your agreement to lease that they get the two car garage, then they should be um, getting the two car garage without having to share it with anybody else. Additional terms, you're gonna wanna put in here schedule A and B and the residential tenancy agreement. And then paragraph nine, you're just repeating yourself schedules A and B. And then typically you wanna do the irrevocability. You want to schedule this to expire uh, maybe by the end of the day, maybe 24 hours after you send it. So depending on, you know, what time you're sending it, reach out to your growth manager uh, if you want to know when to set the expiry for. But uh, a lot of times it will tell you right in the MLS listing to, to allow 24 hours. All right. Um, okay, so question here, free rent offered by the landlord. Um, honestly, I have never come across free rent offered by the landlord. I know what happens. I just haven't had that experience. But um, yeah, if free rent is being offered by the landlord, then that's something you would just want to put in the Schedule A. All right. So um, quick notes here about the signature page. So this is the agreement to lease. 
And as you can see, there's a lot of blanks, a lot of places for people to sign. So really, really quickly, um, I will tell you, all you need is to get your tenants to sign paragraph 21. Oftentimes I see this happen where agents ask for their clients to sign under paragraph 21 and right away sign the acknowledgement down at the bottom. So the acknowledgement, if you read it here, is acknowledging receipt of the accepted offer and this hasn't been accepted yet. So you don't want to ask your client to sign in both places. You're just asking them to sign under paragraph 21. All right, you need to wait for the landlord to sign back and confirm acceptance before you get your client to acknowledge receipt of the accepted offer. All right, so if the landlord accepts, you've signed paragraph 21, the landlord goes ahead and also signs paragraph 21 and confirms acceptance and acknowledges receipt of the accepted offer. It's at that point that you get your client to also acknowledge receipt. Um, but that doesn't always happen so cleanly. Usually the counter, the landlord will counter. So if you receive a sign back, your client is signing under paragraph 21. And now the landlord has made a bunch of changes throughout the offer. Um, so they've initialed all their changes and they've signed paragraph 21, but it's now up to you, to your client to go and accept all those changes. And if they do, it's your client confirming acceptance and acknowledging receipt of an accepted copy. It's at that point that it would go to the landlord and they would sign their acknowledgement as well. So that page can get messy, but uh, that's why I just like to point it out. All right, so let's talk about that Schedule A. I did mention before that this is auto-populated for you, so there will be standard clauses in here. And yeah, make sure that you're adding anything that's relevant to the property. I used the example of the pool earlier, but somebody just mentioned free rent. If that's the case, make sure that you're putting in you know, a paragraph about what month that's going to be applied to, you know, whatever it is, just make sure that you're reiterating it in the Schedule A. All right, so we are going to be offering web forms training on Wednesdays. So feel free to, you know, come back. And if you haven't done a web forms transaction yet, um, you know, we can walk through that step by step. But basically here in web forms, once you've completed all of your forms, you've filled in those blanks, as we just discussed, you've done that rental um, agreement or the, sorry, the agreement to lease. At that point, you're gonna want to select all of the forms needed for your client to sign. And then hopefully you're using AuthentiSign because it's free, but if not, then use DocuSign, whatever it is that you prefer. But again, if you are using AuthentiSign, making sure that you're selecting the documents that you need your client to sign. And there's a little basket that you can't see behind here. And it's kind of like a, or you're doing online shopping, this is your shopping cart. <laughs> so all of your forms are here and you just wanna send it to AuthentiSign so that you can drag and drop signatures and initials for your client to sign. All right, so once you've received that back from the client, so again, using AuthentiSign, DocuSign, whichever online platform you wanna use for signatures, um, at that point you will have received all these forms that you've prepared, your client has signed, so now is your opportunity to present the offer to the listing agent. And I'm gonna share with you an email that I, again, I. It's simple, you guys can take from it what you'd like or add to it, uh, but uh, definitely in the subject line, you want to be highlighting the fact that this is an offer to lease. If you just put in the address, they might think it's a question about the property, maybe they don't open it right away, but if you put in offer to lease, uh, you know, chances are they'll open it right away. So uh, make sure you're letting them know what it is that you're attaching. So you're attaching the rental application with supporting documents and the offer to lease. So I like to set it up as two PDFs, so I will merge the rental application with the supporting documents as one PDF, and then I will merge the offer to lease as a separate PDF so that they can review the rental application and supporting documents. But if they do want to get back to me, they do want to sign it back, it's all one PDF, uh, the agreement to lease and the confirmation of co-op, they can send that back uh, for signatures. So, that's how I do it. Uh, I also include a paragraph and uh, this is kind of where we get to be creative. Hopefully you like creative writing and you can introduce your clients, talk about how wonderful they are. You know, maybe they're, you know, newer to Canada. They've come, you know, for this reason or that reason. And this is the jobs that they have here. You know, really talk about them. Um, I like to recommend, and this is a, a tip for success that I've, I've heard other agents, you know, it's worked for them as well, to include a family photo. Uh, just because you're introducing people virtually, it's nice to have a photo, you know, what they say, a thousand, a picture is worth a thousand words. So uh, it's a nice way to virtually introduce your client. So talk about them, include a photo, and then also highlight what it is that they're offering. So, you know, making it really easy for the listing agent to know exactly what's coming in. 
what's the lease date you're offering? What's the term? What's the rate? Hopefully it's full ask, maybe a little bit more. And what's the, the deposit? Again, maybe you're offering a little bit more of a deposit, especially if you're in a competitive situation where there are other offers being presented as well. Highlight how long they have um, to respond to the offer. So it's irrevocable until today at midnight. Um, and then I will prepare the residential tenancy agreement upon receipt of the accepted offer. It just shows that you're really gonna be easy to work with. So you might wanna include that in there as well. And then thank you in advance for your consideration. I look forward to hearing from you. So there's a, a template that you might wanna use when presenting an offer. All right. Um, so I'm getting a question about web forms here. So the acknowledgement will be auto-populated for tenant to sign. Yes, thanks for mentioning that, that is true. There are a couple of things, when you are in web forms, make sure that you are paying attention to what gets auto-populated and what gets um, automatically dragged and dropped for signatures. So what I mean by that is, um, when you are completing your agreement to lease, your, all of your offer documents, and you send it to Authentisign, again, Authentisign tries to help us by putting in where your clients need to sign, but just pay attention to that because there are some errors, uh, in particular that one. So it does ask your client to sign paragraph 21 and also acknowledge at the same time. So just make sure you're deleting that. Um, there are some other areas where it forgets to add in your signature. I believe it's the uh, on the confirmation of co-op. Um, there's a signature missing there, so you need to drag and drop that. So you know, technology is there. It's you know, it's it's meant to help us, but it's you know, not human. So just make sure that uh, you're correcting anything that might have been overlooked. Similar to that, on the working with a realtor form, you'll notice that it asks your client to sign both paragraphs. They should only be signing the first one. So you'll wanna delete the second uh, set of initials. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Really pay attention to, uh, again, these things are auto-populated for you, such as the Schedule A, but you know what you're submitting an offer on. You know what clauses you need to include. Um, and similar to that in web forms, you know what paragraphs need to be signed. So if there's something there that's wrong, just delete it. For the most part, it's correct, but there are a couple of things in there that you need to delete. All right. Let's talk about winning this offer. You've presented it to the listing agent. Um, possible objections, you will not be getting any of these because you already addressed them with your pre-qualifying questions at the very beginning during your initial phone call. So, uh, you know, maybe you are representing a single parent who does only have a single income. Again, get creative, ask about child support, child tax benefit, you know, include that so that you're not gonna get an objection later on from the listing agent that there's only one income, it's not enough. Those are not objections that you're gonna come across. And also you've pre-qualified your client, you know that they have a good credit score. So again, the listing agent isn't going to receive your offer and say, you know what, uh, we're not happy with their credit score. Hopefully you're working with somebody who has a credit score in the 700s. Not enough stability. I didn't really talk about this today. Um, but if you have newcomers to Canada, just take the extra step, call the listing agent, make sure that the landlord would consider such a situation. I talked earlier about, you know, finding out what uh, your client's needs and motivations are and finding out about their situation. So it may be that they're new to Canada. The example I shared earlier was maybe it's a roommate situation. So if you are going to, if you're gonna to decide to help them, then just call the listing agent and make sure that that landlord is going to consider a roommate situation so that it's not an objection at this point. So these possible objections, you handled them at the beginning. Um, so hopefully you're not receiving these objections after submitting the offer. A couple of other things that you can do to really win the deal. So I mentioned presenting the offer with a family photo. Make sure that you register the offer or that you call to confirm receipt. Make sure that you get an email back from the listing agent saying received, thanks. And if not, call the listing agent, make sure he received your offer or she received your offer or calling the listing brokerage to register your offer to ensure that they've received it. So you don't want it to, uh, to happen that you follow up the next day because you haven't heard and they didn't receive it and they accepted another offer instead. So make sure they receive it. Um, other ways to win the deal, we've talked about this offering more rent. So maybe it's $50 a month more, $100 a month more, offering more of a deposit. So yes, first and last month's rent is what is required. Landlords aren't allowed to ask for more of a deposit, but you can certainly offer it. So maybe it's six months, maybe it's even a year upfront, um, you know, whatever your clients are prepared to offer. And then of course, offering an earlier start date. I mentioned, you know, maybe if a property is available immediately, maybe they take possession seven days before the end of the month and they start moving in slowly. So that's an option as well. Um, and something that might be attractive to the landlord. All right, as I said, once it's all accepted, 
You can fill in the residential tenancy agreement that is also now in web form, so really easy for you to complete. And uh, basically you're reiterating all of the accepted terms from the agreement to lease. And it's at this point that if you prepare it, you're putting in your client's email address. Once you send it to the listing agent, they'll fill in the landlord's address for notices. They'll fill in the landlord's direct email address, contact information, phone number, whatever it is, uh, because really this is now the landlord and client exchanging information. So if you go ahead and prepare this, uh, it, again, it just shows that you're really easy to work with. All right, so um, just getting a comment here. Didn't know that you could do advanced rent. I thought it's only first and last month. Yeah, so first and last month's rent is all that is required, but if you want to really be competitive, ask your clients if they'd be willing to offer a little bit more of a deposit. So especially if they are new to Canada, that's oftentimes kind of what you have to balance it with, uh, that you might offer, yeah, first and last three months rent, first and last five months rent, whatever it is. You can certainly offer that and just put in the residential tenancy agreement that the tenant is voluntarily offering this deposit. It's not the landlord demanding it, but yes, you can definitely offer an increased deposit. Awesome, awesome. So once you've received an accepted offer, it's always exciting, but there are a few things still left to do. So make sure that that deposit check gets delivered to the listing brokerage. Ask your clients to go to the bank, get their bank draft, send you a copy of the bank draft, deliver it to the listing brokerage. The listing brokerage should send you a receipt. Those, those are things that you're going to need. And then you're gonna to wanna to upload all of your documents to web forms in the checklist section. So again, join me for web forms on Wednesdays. Uh, we talk about that. Of course, don't forget to update your CRM. And then there are some things that you can do to stay in touch with your clients between getting that offer accepted and move in date. Remind them to transfer utilities into their name. They must obtain tenant's insurance. You need a copy of this. You need to send it to the listing agent. Otherwise, chances are they may not get their keys. Even though they've paid a deposit, if they don't have tenant's insurance, there are landlords who will refuse to hand over the keys unless there's proof of that. So make sure you remind your clients to get tenant's insurance and to send you a copy of it. Um, and then if post-dated checks, if that was the agreement, make sure that again, you remind your clients <laughs> to prepare them, which sometimes means ordering them. Not everybody uses checks, but for some reason landlords still prefer checks. So if that's the case, make sure that you're telling your clients to order checks well in advance so that they have their checks on time. And again, there isn't gonna be an issue getting keys on possession date. So you may want to attend that meeting with the landlord and the client on or before the occupancy date. You can do a walkthrough, you can note any deficiencies. If there's a key deposit being provided, maybe you write out a receipt. So it is nice to be there just to make sure everything goes smoothly, um, that they get their keys, you know, in exchange for those posted checks if that was the, um, the arrangement and then they're all set to move in. So uh, attend that if you can uh, and that will be the end of the transaction, but of course you don't wanna to forget to follow up with them. So make sure that you're following up with them, you know, in a month, see how things are going in the new place. And then certainly in a year, see if they're ready to, you know, are they gonna stay, are they ready to buy? You know, where are they in the process? So definitely staying in touch with them periodically. Awesome, let me see, do you guys have questions? Um, Post-dated checks, could you direct deposit with landlord? Yeah, so that's definitely something that you can talk about in the offer. So that's part of negotiating the offer. Yes, oftentimes tenants would prefer to do email transfers. So if that's the case, you can just change that in the offer and hopefully that gets accepted. So sometimes what I've seen done also is that the landlords still want the post-dated checks in their possession. Maybe they don't deposit them, but if they don't receive that email transfer, they have the checks to deposit. So that might be something you put in the Schedule A. Awesome. All right. So um, last but not least, this is web forms as well. So I talked about uploading all of your forms to the checklist, making sure that you change the status to firm deal. This is all stuff that we can walk through during a web forms webinar, but uh, hopefully you guys are feeling really comfortable right now with how to do leases. Um, yeah. Not forgetting to enter your deals in the, um, in the CRM and then also uploading your documents to web forms. So, all right, how are we doing? We've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> Let me know if you guys have questions. So we do have the workplace channel uh, or within the workplace group, I should say, we have a leases channel. So if you ever have questions, you know, feel free to post on there. People will chime in. Uh, Ronnie or myself can answer questions as well. So, uh, but in the meantime, as I said, we have a couple of minutes. If you have questions now, I'm happy to answer them. But uh, as I said, Hopefully this makes you feel really equipped to handle lease leads.
I have a question. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the deposit, how it's typically the first and last month's rent, um, would that be given in one check at the same time or would the last deposit, last month's deposit be a separate post data check? Yeah, so it should be one bank draft. So in the offer, it'll say first and last month's rent in the amount of $4,000 if the rent is 2000 and that should be one bank draft payable to the listing brokerage. Okay, and does the agent bring it to the listing brokerage or the client? Typically the client, um, you can do that as a service, but because the client is probably already out going to the bank to get the bank draft, hopefully the, the brokerage isn't too far away and they yeah. can just drop it off at the same time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I have a few people chatting with me. Um, can we do without the residential lease? I did not receive one from the listing agent since November 6th. So yeah, we do need the residential tenancy agreement. So that is mandatory. Um, so if the listing agent hasn't provided one, then I would just go ahead and prepare one just so that they have it because it is, as I said, mandatory. All right. Sorry, I do have one more question. This is yeah. in terms of the five leases for new agents. Yeah. Um, so do they all have to be Zolo leads for the five leases? No, not at all. So yeah, feel free to post on Kijiji Marketplace, generate your own leads. Um, you will get lots of leads at Zolo. There won't be yeah. a shortage, but yeah, if you want to generate your own, you absolutely can. And uh, also, do they have to be commercial or, sorry, does, do they have to be residential or can they also be commercial? Um, no, I think they can be, typically they're residential, but yeah, if you have a commercial lease and that's one of your five, that should be fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. If you have any other questions, of course, you can reach out to me, to Ronnie, and we've got the Workplace channel in place as well. But uh, we are exactly at time. So thank you so much, you guys. I hope that uh, you were able to take away some uh, good information. And I will see you guys on the next webinar. Thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.